take an object which has three sides and rotate it so that it lands back to its original position. We've just created a cyclic group, a rotating group, with three elements, or order three. We can also flip it and rotate the flipped version of the object. This in turn creates this symmetric diagram, where the red represents rotation and the blue a flip. The name of this group is S3. Each triangle can be replaced with nodes and corresponding ladders, R for rotation, F for flip, and E for what is known as the identity element, the original position or the starting point. But the initial group we observed, C3, is still clearly inside and acts exactly the same as C3 would by itself. We don't ignore it and instead label it as the subgroup of S3, written like this mathematically. C3 is composed of E, R, and R squared, but it is technically only the action of rotation. So instead, we can write it as C3 equals to the group generated by R. This is called a generator, because by using this, we can generate the entire group. If we look at S3 a little longer, we observe that C3 is not the only subgroup. There is another one, C2, which is just the flip between the two elements E and F. Since it's just a single action of flipping, instead of writing C2 equals EF, we replace it with F. And what about the other, so-called copies of F, which appear throughout the rest of the diagram? And what about the subgroup R, which we also see repeat itself twice in the diagram? Each are copies of either R or F. So you think when we talk about them, it doesn't really matter which one we pick to show the subgroup. Well, actually, it does. A subgroup, because it is a group, must have an identity element. This is the subgroup of C2, because it contains E. So what would you call the rest? Cosets. They are copies of the subgroup structurally. If you observe closely any type of group, every subgroup will have a coset, and these will cover every node of the diagram. So Cayley diagrams are just composed of copies of subgroups, also known as cosets. So far, we've mostly looked at cosets visually, but we can describe them algebraically just as well. To multiply AB, for example, we start at node A and follow it to node B. But say we want to generate the entire coset generated by F and start at the node R, for example. How would we do it? We'd put it like this, R times the coset generated by F. This means that we start at the node R and follow all the paths in the coset generated by F. We multiply the element R by the list of elements of F. R times Z is R, by the way since when you multiply an element by the identity, it results in the element. And that's how visually we end up generating this coset, named RF. In more general terms, this is expressed as the copy of H, H being the name that we give a coset, based at A, a node, is named a H. But each coset can actually have more than one name. In the initial case, we can say that it is the copy of the coset generated by F based at R. But it is equally true if we say that the coset generated by F based at RF. They are the same because we can generate the coset starting from any of its elements. In more general terms, if the coset AH contains an element B, we could have just as well called it the coset BH. The name you choose to represent a coset is called a representative. The fact that we put A or B on the left side of H is also not a coincidence. It is actually more appropriate to call it a left coset. A right coset, then, is HA or HB. Or if we take an actual example, instead of saying R times the coset generated by F, we say the coset generated by F times R. And instead of multiplying from the left, as we have done previously, the multiplication is done on the right. But if you compare it to the previous calculation, you'll see that they actually don't match at all. They therefore look quite different on the Cayley diagram as well. 
Although that's not to say that they will always be different. Sometimes they happen to come out equal, like in this example here. The point is to remember that they can lead to different results. Despite leading to different results, we can observe something that will always remain true. Every element will appear in exactly one coset. Let me clarify that. In this diagram, we see that not only do the left cosets of F or EF cover all of S3, but also that no cosets nor their elements overlap. This is equally true for the right cosets of F. Thus, a question comes to mind. Is this a coincidence? Do the cosets of the subgroup always partition the group so perfectly? The answer to this lies in Lagrange's theorem, named after mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange. We'll only deal with left cosets here for simplicity, but you can think through it in right cosets just as well. The first thing just formalized what we just established before. If we have the subgroup H in a group G, then each element of G will belong to exactly one left cosat of H. How can we prove that? Well, suppose we have an element little g in the group capital G, and for some reason it looks to us like it belongs to both the left cosat AH and BH. Let's see if that's true. If G is in AH, it is therefore appropriate to say that GH equals AH, as we observed earlier. And since it is likewise in BH, then GH equals BH. In that case, AH equals BH, and both are equal to GH. This means that AH and BH are just two different names for the same coset. What we've established tells us that G can be perfectly partitioned into copies of the subgroup H. When we say G to represent groups, we imply their size to be finite. There exists a version of this theorem for infinite groups, but in this case, we'll just be talking about finite groups. So how big G is can be established just by counting how many copies of H there are, which is N. And so G is the same as multiplying that N by H. This number N actually has a name. It's called an index. Thus, to formalize what we've established, if H is the subgroup of G, then the index of H in G, which we write as G, colon H, means how many times H goes into G. So the index is N, which is the total number of left cosets of H, if we count H itself as a coset. This becomes concrete when we consider the example of the subgroup generated by F, which is a subgroup of S3. The order or number of elements of S3 is 6, which is composed of three cosets, including the subgroup of order 2, meaning that all three cosets contain two elements each. Thus, the index, or the n, that we established earlier is 3. Lagrange's theorem implies many different things and raises many questions, like whether it can be turned around. If you'd like to know more and also how it leads to silo theorems, please let us know in the comment section below so that we can make a video dedicated to it. Also, do not forget the PDF link in the description below so that you can follow in details everything that we've seen here today. Remember, that's the only actual way of learning math, by trying to reproduce everything by yourself and understanding each step. So please check out the PDF below. This video was based on this book. Link in the description. If you like this video, check out this one. I'm sure you'll love it. See you there.